The Long Haul Podcast, America's Irish Voice. Interviews with inspiring immigrants, renowned Irish personalities, and discussions on all things Irish America. Presented by Michael Dorgan. I took a trip down to the New York Irish Whiskey Festival a few weeks ago where over 1,300 Irish whiskey lovers packed into the view at Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. The festival brought world-class whiskey experts to one spot to promote renowned brands such as Bushmills, Powers and Teeling as well as newer brands like Lost Irish and Rowan Co. The event was established in 2019 by Moira Breslin of Articulate Productions along with Belfast duo Sean Muldoon and Jack McGarry, the co-owners of the famed Dead Rabbit Bar. Having been cancelled for the last two years, it was great to see the crowds back, enjoying the atmosphere, copious amounts of Irish whiskey and soaking up the views of the Statue of Liberty. At the event, I spoke to Sean about how the Irish Whiskey Festival came about and why Irish whiskey is such a booming industry, while he also chats about the concept behind the Dead Rabbit, which has been awarded the title of the best bar in the world. In recent days, Sean and Jack have actually announced that they will be parting ways from the Dead Rabbit, with Sean opening a sister bar called Hazel and Apple in South Carolina, while Jack will be staying at the Dead Rabbit to work on its expansion into New Orleans and Austin, Texas. In our next episode, I chat to County Loudman Tim Hurley about his new Irish whiskey called Lost Irish. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast. Will you just go back and uh, tell me about your own story? You're from Belfast and uh, you grew up in Belfast and when you came to New York or did you come to somewhere else in America first? I came to New York. Um, What happened was I ran a bar in Belfast um, it was a cocktail bar in the Merchant Hotel, and uh, it was voted the world's best bar. It feels like a cocktail. And people in Belfast didn't believe it when you were the best bar in the world. Uh, they thought this is a joke. Um, so there was a, a guy from Galway um, who lived in Belfast many, many years, but he worked for the New York City Stock Exchange. And he used to come into the bar, and he seen what we were about, and he seen what we were doing for Belfast, and he thought, you guys are in the wrong place, you need to be in a big city. Like somewhere like London, somewhere like uh, New York is what he said. And he was based in New York. So we said, if you come to New York, I'll invest in you. Uh, and he did invest in us. Now, he, the problem with that is he didn't know the first thing about bars. Um, he reckoned we would be open in six months. It took two and a half years. But we did come because we knew he was a man of his word and we knew he would put his money where his mouth was. So that's how it happened. It was basically, we were the best bar in the world in Belfast. And according to Tales of the Cocktail, in 2010, and this customer that had been coming into the bar for two full years. What was the name of the bar, sorry? The Merchant Hotel in Belfast. A customer who, who came in called Connor Allen from County Galway. A fluent Irish speaker. I, I made out because that's interesting. I, I, I like the fact that he's a fluent Irish speaker. But he, um, he came into the bar, he was worked for the New York City Stock Exchange, and he said, you guys need to be in a big city. You need to." And he compared it to, like, to be honest with you, he compared it to uh, degrees in universities. He said it's like getting a degree in, in Belfast terms, Jordanstown, and getting a degree in Queens. And he said, I said, but a degree is a degree. And he goes, no, 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 a degree is not a degree. It's where you get the degree. And I didn't understand that. But so being the best bar in Belfast, best bar in the world in Belfast, and being the best bar in the world in New York are two different things. That's what he taught me. Yeah. And he didn't know anything about the bar industry, but he knew that if you come to New York and you're able to do the same thing that you did in Belfast, you'll get so much more opportunity. And that's why I went. So. And what year did you come to New York? I came did, you, did you sell up the bar in Belfast? So in Belfast, we were voted the world's best bar. Um, and I, you gotta understand, we were a bar in Belfast and we were the only bar outside of New York ever to win it at that point. All right, okay. So the, the awards, the Tales of the Cocktail Awards started in I think 2007. And before we won it, there was three New York bars that won it. We were the first bar outside of New York ever to win that, and it was world's best, and it was according to the world's best cocktail people. So it was a big achievement. Um, it really was like, when you think about it, it was an outstanding achievement. Um, the fact that London or nobody like that was in, uh, got that award before us, um, but we were up against the best. Um, he, we won that award in July 2010. And I was in New York on the 28th of November, 2010. So four months later, uh, five months later, I was in New York. Um, and it took two and a half years for me coming here until we opened to have the dead rabbit. 
What did you say his name was your investor? Connor Allen. And he was from New York, was he, was he Irish or what, what was he, his connection? Uh, he's from County Galway, okay. um, but he had lived in Belfast for many years. Um, he, he, he went to Queen's University okay. and, and he made some money in Belfast, but he was, uh, he's a native from Connemara, I believe he's from Clifton, and um, fluent Irish speaker. I like that, fluent Irish speaker. There's not too many, yeah, but I like, yeah, I like yeah, the fact yeah, that he is. Breed, yeah. <laughs> And so you came over to the, t- tell me about the Dead Rabbit. I, I, I've been down there, it's a beautiful looking bar. Tell me about the, the concept behind this. So the concept, we wanted, I always, I've always believed um, in a two-in-one concept, like uh, even right down to creating cocktails. Like if you take a Mai Tai and a Mojito, those two different drinks, and you make it into one drink, um, and you take certain elements from one, and you take certain elements from another, and you make it your own drink, I've always believed in that two-in-one um, concept, and The Merchant was a two-in-one concept. It was based on two bars that I seen in London. One was a, a hotel bar um, called the Library Bar at the Lanesborough Hotel, and it was a very posh, uh, like real upmarket place, real like highfalutin place. And the other bar was uh, a real deep down and dirty a uh, cutting edge cocktail bar called Milk and Honey. This is going back to the year 2000. And I seen those two bars and I, bo- I worked in both of those bars for like two nights in one and two nights in the other. And I got, I, I really seen behind the scenes and hotel bars back then were very stiff, very like, you had to do things a certain way. You couldn't handle ice with your hands. You couldn't, um, and if you cracked an egg in a, in a drink, it had, you couldn't crack an egg in a drink because it was raw. You had to put egg whey powder that was pasteurized and stuff in, in cocktails. Hotel bars were very stiff and boring. Um, the library bar to me was very elegant. It wasn't cutting edge, but it was elegant and it was, it was really classy. Um, it was different. But what happened was, what I did with The Merchant was I combined two bars. I combined Milk and Honey, which was a cutting edge cocktail bar, and a five-star hotel, which was like, uh, like the Lanesborough. So what I did, and I was the first person to do this, was I brought I made a, a, a hotel cocktail bar. Sorry, I, I put a cocktail bar in a hotel rather than a hotel cocktail bar. Hotel cocktail bars were boring. I created a cocktail bar in a hotel. I was the first person ever to do that. So it was a cutting edge cocktail bar inside a hotel, a five star hotel. And that's what made it different. It was, it was based on two concepts. So the, the Dead Rabbit was based on two concepts. Also, it was based on the bar we worked in, which was the Merchant, which, which was a five star hotel bar. And it was based on an Irish pub like 100 yards from our front door. Um, called the Duke of York. The Duke of York had a massive Irish whiskey selection, um, and it was it, it attracted all sorts of people. That was in Belfast, that part. Belfast. It was 100 yards from the front door of, a, honestly, 100 yards down the street. When you worked in the five-star posh merchant hotel, you weren't allowed to have a drink after work. So when we finished work, we used to go down to the Duke of York, and it was a pub down the street. It was a, an Irish pub, big Irish whiskey selection. Bartenders are wearing jackets. They're not like, like I mean, coats, like, like, like anybody wears a coat. They weren't, they weren't uniforms, um, and they, um, they didn't know much, to be honest with you, they didn't know much about Irish whiskey, but they had a massive Irish whiskey selection. So when we came here, the idea was to create a high-end cocktail bar like the Merchant Table Service with a, with a deep down and dirty Irish pub, and uh, like the Duke of York. So it was bringing those two elements together, and that's what it was. It was, uh, it was our favorite two pubs in Belfast, is what we went for with the Dead Rabbit. We came up with a name, um, the, the Dead Rabbit, how that came about was like, I was looking at when Irish and cocktails in New York sort of came together. And the first ever cocktail book ever was published in 1862 by Jerry Thomas, a bartender that was working in New York. And when I researched him, I realized before he wrote that book, he was working in downtown Manhattan um, on Broadway, um, right below P.T. Barnum's uh, The Greatest Human on Earth, that film. That's based on P.T. Barnum. Um, P.T. Barnum, where Fulton Street uh, train station is, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, where Fulton Street is right now, was P.T. Barnum's. It was a, a place where he attracted all the weirdest things in the world, like uh, like the the, uh, the Elephant Man, those types of people, that are, are Joe Kidd, the, the, the big ape from uh, from uh, Africa, whatever it was, he, he attracted all the weirdest types of things possible. Like a Sam, somebody with two heads, that's what he was about. He was weird and wonderful. Jerry Thomas was a bartender. The guy who wrote the first ever cocktail book in 1862, in 1848, 
he was working right under his balloon. And he was this amazing bartender that people went to before they went to P.T. Barnum's or after they went to P.T. Barnum's. And he had to live up to what they were doing in that, because that was a marvelous spectacle. So he was doing like blue blazers, flaming liquid co concoctions from one beaker to the other. He had to live up to what was happening upstairs. So 1848, he was downtown Manhattan. And we all know Irish history, 1846 to 1851, famine happens. And those people who come to New York, they arrive in downtown Manhattan and uh, were South Street Seaporters, which is literally half a mile from where Jerry Thomas was doing his, his liquid concoctions. So I come to realize Irish immigrants were arriving in, a, in Lower Manhattan, 1846, 1851, from the famine torn Ireland. These bartenders, not just Jerry Thomas, other bartenders like him were doing fancy stuff on Lower Broadway. And this is a half a mile difference between both. It's like an like eight minute walk between both. And it was like the have nuts and the have. And I thought, right, everything was happening in Lower Manhattan. Irish and cocktails were happening in Lower Manhattan in the 1840s, mid 1840s. And I thought, how can I bring that together? So I looked up 1840s, literally, Lower Manhattan, Irish names. And up comes this thing called List of Identities, Gangs of New York, from the film. Not from the film, from the book, Herbert Asbury's book. And I looked at it, I was interested. I looked at it, and I see all these names of gangs, Irish gangs. The Carrionians, the Plug Uglies, the uh, Chick Chesters, all these Irish games, and one of them was called the Dead Rabbits. And I thought, wow, what an interesting name, the Dead Rabbits. So I looked into the Dead Rabbits, and I realized there was this character called John Morrissey, who was from Tipperary, who led the Dead Rabbits at one point of his life. And he was an unbelievable character who lived 48 before he died. But unbelievable character. What he did in his 48 years was like, very few people have ever done that, 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 that level of achievement. So I thought, right, not only do we have a name, we have a character, we have a story, we have everything together, but it was all based on our two favorite bars in Belfast. And all we did was make it make sense in New York. So we had a pub upstairs that was based on what was happening on Broadway, which was our merchant hotel where we worked. And we had a pub downstairs, which was uh, based on uh, the Duke of York in Belfast, which was based on when Irish immigrants would get off the bar, they went up to the local watering holes that were like literally at the port. So, The Dead Rabbit, that's, that's how it came about. Did, did you open The Dead Rabbit before the film came out, The Gangs of New York? No, no, no. The, the film had been out a long time. I, I, swear, when I, when I, I promise you when I say this, I had no idea when I watched the film that there was a gang called The Dead Rabbits. I, what, I, what I walked away from with that film was knowing who Bill Poole was. And the film is called Bill Cutting because he cuts things, but his real name is Bill Poole. But, Butcher Bill, isn't it? Yes, Butcher Bill. But the thing is, again, the film was a pro-American film. Um, in real life, the Irish defeated those guys, and it's like Bill, John Morrissey, that guy, John Morrissey killed him in real life. It, but John Morrissey isn't even mentioned in the film. It's like, because the film was a pro-American film. The Irish triumphed 100% in that fight, and you don't see it in the film. I, I, one, one of my uh, ambitions, actually, is to create the real, the real story of what happened, because uh, the story of John Morrissey is an unbelievably fascinating story. Way, way, way more interesting than Billy, Billy Butchers. Way more interesting. This guy was like, this guy, I'll give you an example who John Morrissey was, the leader, one-time leader of Dead Rabbits. He was the American heavyweight boxing champion. He was a, a, a congressman. He was a member of the state senate twice. He founded Saratoga Racecourses. He, 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 he owned a baseball team. This guy, in 48 years, what he achieved was just, nobody, nobody achieves what he achieved in 40 years. But that's, that's our story, is John Morrissey. Tim was telling me earlier that uh, Liam Neeson gave you a gift. T talk to him about that. He's actually going to be on the bar on Tuesday night. Um, but he's, uh, yeah, his son is very, um, his son's launched a tequila brand. And he's very, um, he's very, uh, in the, his son is in the bar all the time. Lovely guy. Um, but Liam and Kieran Hines and um, Aidan Quinn, I believe, are coming down on Tuesday night. There are three mates and hang out. Um, but... And you can, t you can post this afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it already takes you a week to get these out. He, he came in and uh, he gave us the sword. He gave it to me personally. And it was, it was a good thing. I mean, it's, it's behind the bar. Yeah, so what we ex ex explained to he, so he gave you the, the cross. Was it the cross or the... Yeah, so if you watch the film, there's a scene at the start when they're fighting. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very important scene. Um, it's a very opening scene. Um, it's snowing. And Bill the Butcher starts calling... Priest Valon. There is no character in the real in real life called Priest Valon, by the way. I don't even know who that's based on. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. But Liam Neeson is Priest Valon, and uh, he's Leonardo DiCaprio's father. 
who is meant to be sort of John Morrissey, but he's not John Morrissey at all, because John Morrissey was a completely different character. But he pulls the sword out of a, some sort of a sheath, yeah. and he says, let's have you, whatever it is. And the sword that we have now is actually broken in half. And um, when Liam Neeson gave it to us, he said, um, I broke it over some native's back. Uh, during the film, because he uh, so he hit, so hit somebody, the enemy in, in the film, but it was obviously, to be honest with you, the sword isn't a prop. It's a, it's a proper it's a proper sword. That's what he said. He obviously didn't because it's a it's a proper. I wouldn't say it's a proper proper sword, but it's 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 definitely not a a wee flimsy thing that breaks apart when you touch it. But um, yeah, so it's behind the bar now, but there is a break in it, and uh, he kept it for the right person, and he came down and presented it to me personally. So uh, tell me about the, the, the bar the last couple of years, you, when you set it up, did it, did it take off straight away or what was the, the reaction from people here? And was it all worthwhile to, to move? Yeah, so what happened was, again, it goes back to what that guy said, um, in New York you'll get so much more opportunity than you will get in Belfast. Because over there, you're fighting the fight, it's people like you, you're, it's like-minded people. And, and, when you, and, and by the way, this was a very, very true thing because, see right now, in Belfast where we're from, Dead Rabbit is a massive, massive thing. The Merchant, when we were there, was never a massive thing. And it's like, when you talk to the people in Belfast and I say, these guys were the world's best in Belfast, they still don't actually believe it to this day. You have to be the best in New York for people to believe it. It's just one of those things, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Irish thing. But um, yeah, so we came over here, we were these guys in the cocktail community. Um, so Jack was an, an incredible bartender. Watching Jack, I don't know if you ever watched George Best play football when he was like playing for Man United. But Jack was like George Best playing football when he was bartending. He was, he was a, a specially gifted bartender, uh, 100%. So I'm an ideas guy. I'm the, I'm the vision. I come over here with a plan, the, the dead rabbit, the, the idea. Um, and, but I need that bartender to back me up because otherwise it's all bullshit. And it's like, uh, I need that guy. Jack was that guy. So we come over here, the dynamic duo. We come over here and we kicked ass. Uh, we opened the bar in February the 12th. John Morrissey's birthday, um, which was the day he was born. John Morrissey, the leader of the Zetterbus, appropriately enough. Hurricane Sandy held us back by like four or five months. So when we opened the bar, we were busy from the word go, getting busier and busier and busier. And I think what we did, we became, it was something very, very different for America. Nobody had ever seen anything. It was the most publicized bar opening in New York City history. Uh, we were, we had so many interviews and articles before we even opened the bar. Uh, I'm talking a hundred, maybe, in all kinds of different publications, New York Times, Washington fucking Post, whatever it was. We had a hundred different articles in mainstream newspapers before we opened the bar, because Hurricane Sandy held us up. And it's, it's, it's became the bar that everybody wanted to see opening, um, because it was heavily publicized. And um, so we were busy from the word go. Um, we opened the bar in February the 12th, and in mid-July that same year, the Tales of the Cocktail Awards we won for The Merchant. It took us like five years to win those awards. Four or five months later, uh, we, were, we won three. We won world's, world's best cocktail menu, world's best bartender, Jack, my, my buddy. And uh, we won um, best new, because it was a brand new bar, best new American cocktail bar. We were in the final 10 and seven awards and the final four and four awards. So, I mean, it was unprecedented. It was never been, it's never been done before and it will probably never be done again. It was like a real shockwave. It was sent all across America when we opened that bar. So, and it comes from, we were the two unknowns that came from Belfast. Um, so, a, a funny story is, before we won, before we won the uh, World's Best Bar in 2010, the, the year before, 2009, we won three awards, uh, but we didn't win World's Best Bar. We won World's Best Hotel Bar, we won World's Best Cocktail Bar, and we won World's Best uh, drink selection. We were the first ever bar to win a hot trick of awards, was the bar in Belfast. Nobody had ever, it was unprecedented in Belfast. And then when we came here, it was unprecedented all over again. So, so that was the, uh, yes, uh, uh, immediately, we were busy immediately. You do a solid Guinness too, do you? Listen, it's never gonna be as good, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The Guinness that we do is as good as it gets in New York, but that doesn't mean it's anything like the Guinness you get in Ireland. Um, and I'm. I'm it's as good as we can possibly do. Uh, but trust me, I've been to, I've, I've had magical pints in Ireland that you're just never gonna get anywhere else except Ireland. I've had them and they do exist, you know?
Do you own any other bars in New York? No, we used to own Black Hill, which was a Cuban bar just across the street from here. Okay. Um, and it was an amazing bar, uh, but it was in a weird location. Uh, it was right beside the Statue of Liberty, just over here. And, um, but it was in a complex, okay. and we had we, the barbers upstairs. Anybody who had the good fortune of ever going to it will tell you what an amazing bar it was. Um, I have no doubt that they'll tell you that because it was an amazing bar. People actually prefer it over Dead Rabbit, many people. Um, we're not Cuban, but we have a love affair with Cuba. I've been to Cuba like five or six times uh, all over the country. I, I love Cuba. And um, it was a very special and also a big, massive Ernest Hemingway fan. So it was a, it was a dedication to Hemingway in many way, and it was also a dedication to Cuba. But it was done like I've been to Cuban bars in this country. And I'm just being brutally honest, nothing comes close to what we did. It, it was a different level. Um, we're just not Cuban. Um, so people in this country would think, oh, you have to be Cuban to have a Cuban bar. And they, the, the, the person that is Cuban that has a Cuban bar will get their vote. We're not Cuban. Uh, it's false. It's, it's fabricated because we're not Cuban. But trust me, I love Cuba with, with a passion. I, I, I haven't been there in a few years, but I absolutely, it's, a, it's like a, I miss it. I, I long for it. Um, it's a, it's a very very special place in my heart. And by the way, for a lot of people from Northern Ireland anyway, I don't know about I don't know about the rest of Ireland, but in Northern Ireland, it's it's because of that struggle thing. It's because of that shit we've all been through. The island mentality. It's we've all been through that same thing, and we identify with one another. And um, it's like a, I just love it. I love I love everything about it. And it's a it's a special outside of Ireland. It's my favorite place in the world. All right. You know? okay. Outside of Ireland. Oh, when did that close? It closed like literally two months before COVID. Right, okay. and it's because it was in a complex and uh, if that bar if it was stand alone somewhere else people are constantly there was a, an article in, in Time Out magazine recently the bars the clothes that we most want to see brought back and Black Tail was the number one bar right, everybody okay. wants it everybody wants the return of it uh, but we just don't have a the, the space wasn't right how did you fare with the pandemic with the dead rabbit listen it was tough I'm not going to tell you a lie it was tough um, we plotted through it we survived but it, it was tough it wasn't like the same as that, and by the way, I, I paid a lot of attention to what was happening in Ireland as well. And I know that people back there, those pubs that have been around for 200 years, they went through even harder struggles. But it was we, we struggled the same. It was it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't. No, you've no outside area either to. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about the, this this whole. Well, let's get to the, the the Irish whiskey festival. We were all here today. Um, of course, you set it up in 2019. It's the second version now, isn't it? Tell me about the whole the thought process behind it. And I must say, it's been uh, we're halfway through it here today. The crowds have been amazing. But uh, why did you decide to put it all together? So Maura Maura Breslin is the organizer, and she's her mum's Irish, and she's married to a guy from Dublin. She's very Irish. She's English herself, but she's very Irish, and she's here. But She's very proud of her Irish heritage, and um, she suggested doing this. She's a visionary, like myself. Um, but she, she imagined this, dreamed this up three or four years ago, and uh, we had the first one, the same place where Black Hill was, just over there, oh, the other yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, Laura said it. Um, so that's where the first one was. That was just before the pandemic, and it, had, it was ready to gain momentum. You know, like a year later, it'll be busier, a year, a year later, it'll be, it'll be better and better and better, but because of COVID, we had to put it aside for two years. So I, I'm really happy to see its return. I didn't, I did not know how this was gonna turn out because of COVID and I'm very, very happy. I think it's been a big success and, and I, I, I'm proud to be part of it. Whatever way I am, like Maura wants me and Jack to be like ambassadors, uh, but it's Maura's show, it's not our show. We're, we're ambassadors. We 100% we promote it and stand by it, but it's Maura's show um, and fair play to her. She's she's a, she's the one that sticks her neck in the line, and she's the one that's taking all the risks. Was it the tree we came up with it? So was it? More is came up with it. Okay. Uh, but but before we uh, organized it, before we uh, before we actually agreed on it, Mora sat down with us, okay. spoke to us, made sure we were all 100% in the green. Yes, and then we all agreed. But it was Mora's idea. It was her brainwave. It was her. Like, it was her idea. I went in 2019, you had the first one. It was it, uh, 2020, was it stopped because of the pandemic, was it? Yeah. So you were all, like, it was like that week, was it? Yeah, and we don't know, like, we never knew how this, how today was going to be because of the pandemic. We just didn't know, but it was, I personally think it's been very successful. I'm very happy with it. Yeah. 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 So tell me about, like, what's going on today. There's uh, 25 different uh, whiskey brands here, upstairs and downstairs. People come in and they can just taste all the whiskey. I see there's a guy cutting hair upstairs. There is uh, the, some beauty on and everything. So 
Listen, it's a. Uh, it gives a lot of New York consumers um, the chance. Obviously, New York's a massive market for Irish whiskey. Not just New York, but America. But New York is probably the, the epicenter of America when it comes to Irish whiskey. And you want people, people in Ireland want to get interest in people over here, especially in the city. Um, and th th the amount of people that have been here today from New York, like regulars in our bar, for example, customers um, coming in here and appreciating Irish whiskey, getting a chance to talk to the people behind it, to find out more about it, and to sample a few drinks made with it. It's, 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 a, it's a really good thing. It's a very, very positive thing for Irish whiskey. Very positive. I'm very, I'm, very, I'm very proud of it. There's a lot of smaller brands here, people just coming into the market. It's a great entry. It's a great place to promote your brand. Yeah. I was on uh, LinkedIn a few weeks ago, and I only, I only joined LinkedIn. LinkedIn uh, honestly, I only joined it three months ago, and I put a post up about this. And a lot of the wee smaller distilleries seen my post and they said, um, and I'm not joking you, three of them reached out, how can we be part of this? And I put them on to Maury's, uh, I give them Maury's info, and the three of them are here today. And it's like, wow, I mean, they're all here. And they're from Donegal, they're from, uh, they're from, uh, they're from Donegal, yeah, from Donegal. And it's like, how, like I can't believe that that, that that social media post was enough to make you come here, you know, it's, but they're here. And four, and four upstairs. So is there more than 25 here altogether, is there? Yeah, I would say, I would say 25 to 30, definitely. Um, but it, listen, it's good. I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. I don't know what you think, but I'm pleased with it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just blown away by the amount of people here. I'm blown away by the whole industry, to be honest with you. I, I, I'm not, not a whiskey drinker, I'm a layman to this. I see a lot of brands coming on the market, and it looks to me from the outside that it's kind of a, an oversaturated market. But Tim was telling me that it's, uh, it's only kicking off. Yes, but the, you got to understand, Irish whiskey was the predominant, it was the predominant spirit, spirit in general. I'm talking about out of all the spirits in the world you can think of. So cognac was the predominant spirit way back in the mid 1800s and then a disease like a, a, a attacked the vines of, of the, the grapes. Um, phylloxera it was called. But it, it uh, destroyed the cognac production. And Irish pot still Irish whiskey took over as the number one spirit in the world. And then prohibition happened. And a lot of different factors took place. There was the Irish War of Independence. It was all these kinds of factors took place at the turn of the, like, 1920, that sort of time, that affected Irish whiskey, and Scotch whiskey took over. Um, and Irish whiskey in the 1970s was right on its knees. It was, it was almost extinct at one point. And now you're literally witnessing it's, it's potentially going to take over Scotch whiskey. It's the, it's the number one whiskey in the world right now. It's so cool. Everybody's talking about it. And listen, it, it is the work of a few big people that are making that happen, but it's great that all these smaller people are jumping on and um, because listen they're they're, re they're reclaiming the throne that is rightfully theirs that's why i look at it you know it was theirs and probation happened and a lot of different factors affected that but they're they're reclaiming their throne that's the way i look at it so fair play to them all of them so it's a booming market uh... it's getting bigger all the time all the time i mean like when we first opened this bar jack and tim did a tour of the distilleries in Ireland, and there was like five distilleries. Honestly, five distilleries. Now, we did, we did a book five years ago about the distilleries and pubs of Ireland. At that point, there was 33 distilleries, actual distilleries. I don't even know how many there are now. It's probably 45, 50, I don't know. There's, there's, that was five years ago, maybe even more. Maybe even more, seriously. Uh, tell me about the, the books that you have here. Uh, so we, have, we have three books. Um, Throw them up there. To the Okay. This is two. This is two of our books. We have three books. Um, one is uh, our love. They're all our love letters to Ireland. Uh, we're over here, and we want to do our bit back for Ireland because Ireland has been really, really good to us. So, three books. Two of them were like self-funded in many ways. We we spent a lot of money. We spent, and this book, this book, we, we bought this out, right? Um, so this is, we only have this in our bar. It's not available on Amazon. It's it's the story of the Irish coffee. Um, we paid researchers in Ireland, researchers in America. We spent about $60,000 making this book. Um, if we make sales through the bar, we make them. But we do, that's not what it's about. We wanted to do something because every time when Irish Coffee Day happens or St. Patrick's Day happens, people do articles about the Irish coffee. And a lot of it's not correct, it's, it's in, improper. We wanted to do the authoritative story of the Irish coffee. This is it. It is 100% accurate. Um, and it's a limited edition. We only have 4,000 4, copies of these. 
That's our lo that's, so Joe Sheridan, the inventor, was from uh, County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. And we wanted to do our little thing for Northern Ireland. Uh, because oh, no, Northern Ireland for years, nothing good comes out of Northern Ireland. So Joe Sheridan. Georgie Vest. The, 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 inv the inventor of the Irish coffee. That's our little claim to fame. And this is his story. So very proud of this. I designed this myself. The I, I, layout. I love the frontage at the yeah. It's an Irish coffee that's made in our bar, but um, I'm very proud of this, especially because I designed this book. It's my book. I masterminded it. It took four years to do, and I'm very, very happy with it. And Paddy Drinks, this book, is our uh, it's it's our guide to Irish whiskey cocktails. Um, it's Gillian's book more than anything. Gillian's my red hand person. Um, she's our beverage director, but she was she's her mum's from Ireland, from Dublin. And her, her mum's family, they're all proper Irish, like proper Irish. Her mum's family all live, still live in Dublin. Her mum lives over here. But Gillian, uh, nobody, when we came to this country, nobody had Irish whiskey in their bar except her. She worked in Death & Company, which is a famous cocktail bar in the city. She was a bar manager. And she had a section of drinks on her, on her menu called Patty Drinks. And it was four Irish whiskey cocktails. And we thought, cheeky little bitch, Patty Drinks. Um, but then we thought, right, she's American and she doesn't understand. Because the people that call Irish people patties and are derogatory were English people. Not really Americans, they don't really, they call Irish people mix. Uh, they don't really know the word patty. It's not a, they don't consider that to be offensive over here. So when she had it, we give her a bag of ball because she's American. And because her mum's Irish, we thought, right, okay, fair play, you're okay with that. So we thought, let's do a book about Irish whiskey cocktails. Gillian will lead it. And let's call it the little section of drinks she'll call party drinks. We, we explain the whole story of how the name came about. And, and when you read it, it's not offensive. It's, she, listen, Irish people can slay Irish people. Nobody else can. We, we can say what we want about ourselves, but nobody else can. So I consider her to be Irish. Her mum's Irish, 100% Irish, like my mum Irish. And um, so I, I, I give Gillian a Bible all that. Um, and then our other book is uh, called From Barley to Blarney. And it's about the, the distilleries and pubs of Ireland. Proper pubs, proper pubs. Because what we found is we were doing a, we were doing a like a. When we went to visit distilleries in Ireland, we met bartenders all the time from America, and they were asking us, "Okay, we're here. Say they were in Celine Distillery, or they were in Tilling Distillery in Dublin. They would say to us, where do we go next? Like they were talking about pubs. We want to see Ireland." And we thought, right, we have to give them a guide of the best pubs. So we, we based the pubs around the distilleries. So if you're going to be in this distillery, these are the pubs in that area that you should go to. Proper, proper Irish pubs. Now, a lot of them have probably since closed. Um, a, a, lot of the, a lot more distilleries have probably since opened. But it's, it's how things were five years ago when we wrote the book. So. From Blarney to Burnie, what's from, the, from Barley to Blarney. From Barley to Blarney. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got a copy of it at home, actually. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. By the way, listen, we have the same guy. It's an Irish guy that writes all our books. Um, and he writes it, he writes it with, he aims it at Irish people. It's for Irish people. And if Americans want to embrace it and enjoy it, this is, it's Ireland. Uh, we have an Irish person that writes it. All of our books, uh, a person based in Belfast, who, he, write, he does all our social media. Um, but it's an Irish, it's an Irish book for Irish people. Yeah. Uh, can you get that book online? We have um, so Barley the Blonde you can buy online. Uh, this book you can buy online, uh, but the uh, the Irish coffee book you have to buy in store. It's a, we paid for that ourselves, self published. Down to the dead rabbit. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka? And that's all for this week. Let us know what you think by leaving us a comment below or on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast. If you like what you hear, why not give us a five-star rating on iTunes or hit that subscribe button to make sure you never miss an episode. My interview with Tim Hurley about his new Irish whiskey called Lost Irish will be out later this week. And don't forget the New York seniors play Sligo in their Connacht Senior Championship Clash at Gaelic Park on Easter Sunday. This should be a cracking contest and a fantastic day with thousands of Sligo supporters expected to make the trip to the Big Apple. There will be an all-star ladies football match Match that morning at 10 a.m. at Gaelic Park, while on Easter Saturday, the day before, the New York Ladies GA are hosting an empowering women's event at Rory Dolan's in Yonkers to celebrate the organization's 30th anniversary. Tickets and other details are up on our website, thelonghaulpodcast.com, where you'll also catch all of our previous episodes and other Irish American news stories. Slongafall and thanks for listening.
And when we got inside the house, the drinks were passed around. The liquor was so awful strong, my head went round and round to me away. You Santi, my dear Annie, oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka to me way? You Santi, my dear Annie, oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka?